It seems that everything is in short supply at the moment. Everything from jelly babies through to petrol and everything in between. And the same is true of games consoles. If you've tried to buy yourself a Series X or a PlayStation 5, you might have had a bit of a job on your hands. But there is another way that you can go if you're looking for something interesting to buy for this Christmas. And it's virtual reality. And I think there's something of a quiet revolution taking place. Virtual reality is starting to become mainstream. And I think that when we look back on the early 2020s, we will acknowledge that this was the time when virtual reality basically came of age. When you think of virtual reality, you might think of something like this. This is where we were in the mid to late 90s. It doesn't really look much like reality at all. And really, it was simply a virtual representation of a very basic set of graphics, albeit rendered not very well um, in very low resolution in front of our eyes. You might, however, think of the other extreme and something like Ready Player One. Well, we're not that far away from Ready Player One. We're closer than you might think. OK, we don't go there instead of real life, well, most of us don't, and we don't have the little boards that you can walk on to give you the full sensation of walking or the whole body suits, although I suspect those might come in time. The truth is somewhere in the middle. But we certainly at the moment have breakout technology. Things started to get mainstream really in autumn 2016 with the release of PlayStation VR. And this brought VR to the masses, and there were some really, really good games, and there continue to be some excellent games on PlayStation VR. But things have got even better, and things have brought us now to something like this, the Oculus Quest 2. It was released autumn 2020, only four years after the release of PlayStation Virtual Reality. And this is potentially the breakthrough device that hits the sweet spot in terms of ease of use and also quality of the experience, both in terms of the graphics and sound as well. And let's just look at how far we've come in four years in terms of the setup. So here is PlayStation VR. So we've, of course, got our VR headset and that has got a cable here. Now that's got to get to your PlayStation. Oh, you've also got somewhere to plug in for headphones and microphones as well. We'll come to that in a moment, I'm sure. Um, to get that to your PlayStation, of course, we're going to need an extension cable here. You just plug the headset in there and then that goes into, well, it goes into a special box. We'll come to that in a moment. The other issue is how do you track this? And so what you had to do, if I pop that over there, is you had to buy PlayStation Eye camera and it would track the little lights so these white things would glow. So there we are. Um, I'm starting to get into slight trouble with the cables already, but let's not worry too much about that. Um, so where does it all connect to? Um, a box. That box, of course, had another power supply. Here is the box itself. I think we've got some extra cables in here. I won't get those out. Um, this was the box, so this cable plugged in here, and then various connections went out the other side. Of course, one of the problems with this is that they released the box with a different version of the HDMI to the PlayStation Pro. So this, which is the first generation, this did not allow HDR pass-through, even though the PlayStation Pro did, which is a bit of an issue. So if you went out and spent huge amount of money on this and a PlayStation Pro, then you wouldn't get the full benefit from PlayStation Pro without sort of decoupling things and having to put them back when you wanted to do VR, which is what I ended up doing. Um, the version 2s, they now are much more compatible and they do have HDR pass-through. But it was a prime example of presumably different parts of the Sony structure not talking to each other. Um, but we haven't finished yet, of course, because if you want to track your hands, although there's a camera, we need these, the PlayStation Move controller, so these would light up. And again, the PlayStation camera here will track them. So we've got our Move controllers, and we've got some cables to charge those. We've got um, a USB cable, 
and various other cables to take this to your PlayStation. Um, so once you've got all that set up, you are ready for some VR experiences on your PlayStation. Here's the Oculus Quest 2. And you can buy, this is a, the official little pod for it, which is rather nice. And if I want to use this, all I have to do, here's the headset, and here are two controllers that I can have in my hand. And they just, you hold those, in fact, I've got them in the wrong hands, but you hold them like that. That's it. I just put a headset on and turn it on. And that's all there is to it. So if you see these little black bits here, these are cameras and they're constantly taking pictures of the surroundings to work out exactly where it is in your living room. And it's so simple. It literally takes about 10 seconds to put on your head and turn on. The one thing that you will notice if you have a go with virtual reality straight away is just the level of immersion. Even though what you're looking at isn't necessarily photorealistic, the fact that it encompasses your entire field of view makes it uniquely immersive. It's very hard to describe in words what it feels like if you've never experienced it. And I would say if you've not experienced it and you ever get the chance, then do so. And it's not just something reserved for young people either. My parents, who are in their late 70s, have had a go with virtual reality and they absolutely loved it. It's not just a young person's game. Immersion is key here and it's what makes it such a unique experience. There are some standout games as well that are helping to make VR mainstream. Probably one of the best games that I've come across is this one called The Room VR. And it's a puzzle game. It's not really an adventure game, it is about the puzzles, but the graphics are superb, the soundtrack is superb, the puzzles are excellent, the hinting system whereby if you don't solve a puzzle it, within a certain amount of time it will give you some hints, that is very, very well judged. And I have to say the environments are really well put together. Here's one at the British Museum and there's actually a sarcophagus waiting to be released from that little holding area you can see on the far side of the room there. An excellent game, highly recommended. All sorts of other experiences await you though. One of the classics that it seems everybody who's got virtual reality is talking about is Beat Saber. This is the quintessential game you have to have if you have virtual reality, where you are holding two lightsabers and you have to chop through blocks. Now, that makes it sound really, really straightforward and simple. Well, it's a very simple idea. Like all good games, it takes very little time to understand what you've got to do. It takes much longer to master. Um, an absolutely fantastic game. And you can play it cooperatively as well with people in the same room if someone else, one of your friends, brings a VR headset round. Or you can play it multiplayer over the internet as well. Lovers of the Star Wars franchise will love all the content. There is a lot out there. One of the best being Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. Again, this is a, a puzzle stroke very basic combat, there is some shooting, there's lots of familiar things from the Star Wars universe. Again, all really, really well realised. And there is DLC coming out for it as well. So a lot of fun there and again, a standout title. And if you're just wondering, well, where are all the first person shooters? Where is all the gory stuff? Well, it's there as well. This is probably one of the most intense VR experiences I've ever had, playing it online with one of my friends who also has a Quest 2 headset. When there are lots of zombies coming at you all at once, it is uniquely intense in a way that I would say that just traditional gaming on a, a two-dimensional screen is not. They're all around you. The three-dimensional audio that you get from these headsets, you can hear them coming up behind you. It's an incredibly effective and intense experience and it stands out not just for the amount of gore that you see there, that's really just a, a bit of a gimmick, but the gameplay mechanic is, is excellent and some of the levels are fiendishly difficult as well. There's certainly something there for everyone.
But of course, VR is not without its issues. So for some people, you might be thinking, no, 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 a headset is most definitely not for me. Well, a number of those issues have now been resolved. Let's take some of the most common ones. If you wear glasses like me, you will have been used to people going, oh, well, you can just put your glasses underneath a VR headset and you try and do it and it's uncomfortable, it's unwieldy. It didn't really work very well. And certainly, if you were of a certain age like me, where you perhaps wear bifocals, well, you certainly couldn't wear those in VR. You had to go and find a pair of glasses just for distance, which is essentially what you're doing when you look in a VR headset. Well, this is a problem no more. There's a number of providers of this solution. Little things that are made to your prescription, you slot them in to your headset. They just fit over the lenses that are already there and then you simply take off your glasses put on the headset just like someone who didn't wear glasses normally would and off you go i can confirm they do work and they do work really well and in terms of a modest investment so mine were about i think 60 or 70 pounds from a uk oxfordshire based distributor I have found that since I had them, I've used my VR much more because it has just been a case of putting on the headset. So if you do need spectacles, don't worry about VR anymore. There are solutions. The other big issue that's not so much overcome as now you're warned about is, of course, motion sickness. And this happens when your eyes and the balance centers in your ears, the semicircular canals in your ears, are sending your brain different signals. So your eyes are saying you're moving, your balance centers are saying, no, you're not moving. And this difference causes in some people quite severe motion sickness. Well, there are techniques. The main one is that games will actually now tell you what their comfort level is. So on the left, something that's got lots of movement in, on the right, something where there's no real movement, or you teleport around, and that's one of the tricks to prevent motion sickness. Instead of actually walking from place to place, you literally just teleport from location to location. And I have to say, all the games that I've played that have been rated comfortable have indeed been comfortable, and I do suffer perhaps more than most from motion sickness. There are a couple of other issues, though, that are perhaps less easy to resolve. If you're going to buy an Oculus headset like the Quest 2, you need to be aware that in order to use it, you will need a social media account. Yes, that's right. Oculus is owned by Facebook, and in order to use it, you'll need a Facebook account. Now, yes, you can turn everything off in Facebook. Is it really the way forward to force people to have a social media profile? I know a number of people who have wanted, they've had a go with my VR headset and wanted to buy one. And as soon as I said, well, you do know you're going to have to have a Facebook account. And they go, no, I'm not going to buy one anymore. I don't want to be on social media. As social media becomes increasingly toxic, People are saying they don't want to be part of it and they should be able to play VR games without having to be part of that. And that's a, a bit of a problem. The other issue is around children because it seems like a fantastic thing for children and young people. You can imagine meeting up in a virtual world maybe going to a concert together. And in fact, this app called Venues, it's currently in beta, is an example that sounds just the thing, where you can go to concerts, you can meet up with your friends. The problem is it's completely public. And there are a number of these social apps that are completely public. Well, you might say, what about parental controls? Well, there aren't really any parental controls because remember, you needed a Facebook account and you have to be 13 or more to have a Facebook account. And so you don't get the parental controls that you would expect with younger children's accounts. But what this does mean is that if these headsets are given to children younger than that, well, they'll be using an account that is assuming that they are an older teenager or an adult. And I bring up this particular app because if you look at reviews, there are some horrendous comments about toxic content. Some of the things that goes on in here are 
really not very nice at all. And they're not really a place for you'd like to be as an adult, yet alone as a teenager, and particularly not as a pre-teenager. There was a particularly horrendous review that mentioned they came across um, a small girl who claimed to be six years old, who was getting a load of grief and a number of inappropriate comments and some of them of a sexual nature and they didn't particularly know what to do in game. We certainly weren't savvy enough to be able to block people or mute people or report people or anything like this. So there are some real safeguarding problems around giving a headset to younger children and of course what makes it worse is unlike normal use where if you're in a shared space the adults in and around that shared space can see what's going on in vr you can be in the same room as the person and you've got no idea what they're looking at no idea what they're seeing and if they've plugged some headphones in no idea potentially what they're hearing either so i think there are some real concerns around that and yes the platforms could do more But I think there's also an element there of parents just perhaps wising up a little bit to what their children might actually be accessing if they plonk a VR headset on them. So I would go so far as to say I don't think it's an environment for children at the moment. But having said that, there's a great deal on there for grown-ups that is of great fun. And the barrier to entry is surprisingly low compared to a next-gen console, for example, and certainly compared to a PC with the sort of VR that you had to connect with lots of cables and things like that and download drivers and all that faff. So it's accessible and you can go to your local high street and you can even buy one from a physical shop. That's such a quaint thing to do, but you can do that. And there's all sorts of other ones out there. That, of course, was a Quest 2. But there's a range of different VR headsets. If you really do have a really powerful PC and you want to connect something to it, then you can do that as well. The time is now, and I think we will look back and think that this is the time when VR started to go mainstream. And if you're looking for something this Christmas and you're disappointed that you don't want to pay twice as much as you should do to a scalper for a PlayStation 5, then seriously consider virtual reality. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, then please feel free to subscribe to my channel for more videos about gaming. Bye for now.